Fantastic. Thank you so much, Mike. It's an honor to be here. It's good to see everybody here. It gets me excited just seeing that everybody else is here and excited about the topic as well. So thank you. Um, I'd like to introduce myself a little bit so you know who you're uh, talking to or he and who's telling you some information here. Uh, but I do want to make this an interactive conversation. So if you have questions up to the slide we're working on, feel free to ask them. But if there are questions beyond what we've covered so far, let's save them to the tail end of the conversation. Um, but at any rate, uh, my name is Matt Webster. Um, I have been uh, all over the place in my cybersecurity career. It's always very exciting, no matter where, what I'm doing or what direction I'm going. So um, I've been in it for more than 25 years. I've been in, I first started out in IT, and then I went to government cybersecurity doing NIST 853, for those who are familiar with the federal side of the house, FISMA. Um, I have done a state New York state government when it comes to healthcare as well. Um, I've done a long list of stuff. I've been in financial services. I have high trust I've dealt with. Um, I've also been in sales a little bit. Um, I have been a chief information security officer three times. I'm a little bit hands-off on the, and not the hands-on person. So if you're looking for specific hands-on capabilities, I'm probably not the right person to speak to. Um, but one of the things that I really wanted to do, and it's, it's something that I believe is very important because you need to convince people who don't understand security to understand what the issues are. That's where I am. I'm a communicator. So um, in my chief information security officer roles, I've done some technical work in the in the past, but I've been away from that technical role, letting other people handle that. So just so you have a little bit of extra context, there's a lot of things that I've done. Um, I've looked at probably close to a thousand different cybersecurity products over the years. Um, I've got a lot of different perspectives from a lot of different uh, directions. Um, presently, I'm heading up uh, Cybergence. So I founded this company in uh, 2023. So I'm acting as the CISO and I'm doing a lot of consulting work and other work for organizations today, um, but I'll go ahead and kick it off from here. So uh, I did not, a lot of people ask me, you know, why did you write the book? And it's like, for me, I'm a very intellectually curious person. There is so much that I learn all the time. I don't make the assumption that I know everything. So I kind of wrote this just as a, hmm, this is a really passion, interesting, passionate topic. And I pay attention to it from a SCADA perspective. I work with a lot of companies that have these healthcare devices and what are the strategies that they're going to use to help defend them? And how do you speak to the business? What kinds of issues do you need to bring up to them to get them to sway their mind to try to do something a little bit different? And that's a big challenge. And I think it's something that um, a lot of chief information security officers and others are struggling with over time. But for the people who are doing the work, doing the configurations and recognizing what the gaps are, a lot of people don't understand just how severe this is, but um, it really was intellectual curiosity. Like, what could I do to write a book around this? What do I know? So that's the direction that I took. And at least now you understand a little bit more where I'm, I'm coming from with this. So what are we going to learn today? We're going to take a look at a few of the medical device cybersecurity gaps. Um, we're going to take a look at the status of healthcare cybersecurity in the United States, because it's not going in a good direction. Uh, we'll take a look at the threat landscape and how IOMT is affecting healthcare cybersecurity. And we'll take a look at a few common sense strategies for improving healthcare. So the agenda, these are the different areas. We're going to cover healthcare status and the threat landscape. Uh, we'll take a look at healthcare technology. We're going to explore how did we get here and uh, IOMT security challenges and, and seeds of change. You know, what's changing in media world. So got a little bit of housekeeping. Um, I do know that there are probably a couple people here that are not IT or security gurus. Um, is there anybody in here who is not? I just want to make sure I'm speaking to the right audience. So if, if everyone can hear me, I am not. However, I'm in the midst of uh, transitioning my career into, but I am on a uh, risk and compliance team for a healthcare facility. So this presentation was extremely up my alley. Thank you for, thank you for hosting and presenting. Great. So I'll take the time to explain a, a few concepts. Uh, a little bit more, though it might be painfully obvious for some of you. Again, it's all about being able to communicate. Um, I've already spoken about the questions. And Let me take out your deck if you're hot. Somebody put him on. Um, so this book was written in 2019. It was the height of the pandemic. Everybody was freaking out and, and worried about a lot of things with this. But the book is dated. You know, there's information that came out afterwards that I wish I would have known about when I was writing the book. And even there's been corrections and things like that, like, oh, that was true at the time, and here's the article to prove it, but things aren't true necessarily now. Uh, now, So that's been a challenge. Whenever you're writing some of these books, even though you cite your sources, you're not always 100% accurate, even though that's your intent. Uh, but what I did during this presentation, if it's updated, I provide some updated information. 
Um, also, if it's new, I provide it, I put a little a tick sticker on it to show you that it's new information. <clears throat> so this is not a book about medical problems. And so the presentation is not about that. There are some cases where medical problems have uh, come about as a result of uh, using IOMT, uh, you know, but really I'm taking a look at the cybersecurity issues with IOMT and how it relates to it. Also, I did not cover everything in the book. There is just too much to cover, too much to do. So things that we don't cover today, let's ask in the Q&A afterwards. I want to leave this open for everybody to have a conversation and uh, go from there because I am full of thoughts. I've got a million different directions I like to go with things because I'm a big picture guy rather than a, a narrow focus guy. But just so you can I kind of understand a little bit more. Um, let's go ahead and dive into it. Any questions so far? Great. So let's take a look at the healthcare status. Um, I thought this was particularly interesting um, because it really shows where we're at. And there are some things in here that are that are eh, marginally okay, but um, some there's additional data that I would like. So threat and vulnerability, for those who are not familiar with the whole concept, basically we're looking for vulnerabilities in the organization. And so what was concerning about this is, A, they say 89% of hospitals are doing at least one quarterly vulnerability assessment. And so I think that's good, but we never know the extent of it. And, and so I have watched, especially hospitals, many of them have been around for decades or longer. Um, it, it's always a challenge because are they really scanning the whole environment? Do they understand what all the different products are in the environment? And so when I look at a number like this, I still can't tell just how good of a job they're doing. I've walked into organizations and they'll have more than a million vulnerabilities and they're still only looking at, you know, 50% of the vulnerabilities that are on in their environment. But so this is done by a questionnaire by the hospital uh, cyber resilience initiative landscape analysis. And this came out last year in 2023. So this is, this definitely is relatively new, but I still found it very interesting. Um, you know, it also says something about the reader, for example, penetration testing, which I think most of you are familiar with where you're doing the hacking against another organization. Only 20% of organizations had that, but they're also considering penetration testing an advanced topic. To me, this is table stakes. You should be doing penetration testing in every single organization. And red teaming is basically creating a specific attack vector and saying how you got into an organization or what you did to go after something. Purple teaming is when you're getting the blue team, which is dealing with the security operation center, which is on the detection side of the house. And so getting the detection and the attacking teams to work together to create that purple team. So that's where the purple team comes from, comes from. But also tabletop exercises are 20%. Tabletops, again, this is just like one of those no brainers. Every organization should be doing a tabletop exercise. Um, so this is really concerning to me that just some of the table stakes that you find even in some basic frameworks like NIST CSF are not being done. Um, but only 70% of organizations did vulnerability assessments against websites. Um, so like dynamic application and security testing for those who are familiar with the acronym. That's pretty small. And a lot of organizations are using PHI in their website, protected health information. So it's related to the healthcare uh, data. And if they're not checking their websites with the vulnerability tool and they've got PHI that's in the site, that's a that's a big concern. You know, again, we don't know definitively what's going on with the sites, but that would be additional information that would have been valuable. Um, but only 53% had a documented documented plan to deal with vulnerabilities. This too is pretty pretty shocking because it shows a level of negligence that's going on within organizations. So 89% are doing some sort of assessment, but only 53% had a plan to deal with it. So great, you got to scan, but not doing anything. It's just not. It doesn't make any sense from a healthcare perspective. Um, a security awareness training, re re relatively happy with that. Of course, that could be better, but you know, 14% of hospitals have no idea. I've been in non-hospital environments and still receive HIPAA training. It's just something that should be built into every organization that deals with PHI. Uh, the multi-factor authentication, uh, again, this is not perfect, but you can at least see that 90% of hospitals at least had something in terms of their MFA. You should have it on your VPN. The email system was much higher than expected. I was surprised to see 88%. But, you know, do local administrators, when they're accessing a server, do they have to have multi-factor in place? Um, does it mean that MFA is in place for everywhere that you're going to be having access to PHI? That's something that they don't go into. Uh, email security, 99%, that's good. URL detection and responses, 86%. You know, it's it's decent, not perfect, but at least people are getting the message. The one that really concerned me though here is the 49% adequate supply chain risk oversight. And when you look at it from a ransomware perspective, 46% of ransomware is caused by a third party. So those who are familiar with like uh, Kaseya or Orion, 
you know, that's an example of a supply chain risk. And what they are is they're companies that go out and gain access to a lot of other environments. And they have usually full access to an operating system when they have access to the environment. And that means that they could do untold amounts of damage. So are they doing the appropriate, what's called a third-party risk to those organizations to determine, A, are they doing a good job? Do they, are they, do they understand where they're at in the supply chain? What's their security look like? You know, we're seeing a lot of issues along the supply chain routes um, related to healthcare, and that's that's definitely a big concern. Now, this next statistic, I think, is probably low about the legacy systems, because I think we'll go into the more details later, but I think that it's probably well beyond 96% of hospitals. Again, it'd be interesting to see the data behind this, which they didn't provide. So some of you may be familiar with the HIPAA wall of shame. It's a very interesting uh, look at what's going on from a healthcare perspective. But this does not include just hospitals. So there's something called a business associate. And, you know, from a legal perspective, you have to make sure that you have a business associates agreement in order to give that information out. So if an organization has that information, they are ending up on the HIPAA wall of shame just for being a associate to a healthcare organization, which are the creators of healthcare data. So it's only going to look at if 500 more individuals are affected and it's roaming for 24 months. So it has a lot of interested, interesting details behind it, but you can see here the primarily primary issue here is going to be hacking and IT incidents and unauthorized access and disclosure. Now, from looking at a lot of other breach reports, that typically is speaking to um, email security. It usually means they they make a mistake and something happens, and it goes on all the time. If you read, like I'm a big fan of reading a lot of the breach reports that are out there. Verizon has a lot of great information. Verizon even talks about this, and that's where the source of the disclosure is coming from in many cases. And you see that below too, the email. Um, but you can see network servers, that's the other key area. There's a lot more I could dive into, but um, you get the gist by looking at this, I think, unless you have any questions. So this is just a quick definition for those who are not used to the cyber threat landscape. Um, it's basically anybody and all their tools and the associations who are going after other organizations. And usually it means that they're part of organized crime. Um, there might be individual cases where that's not the case, but, uh, and it also can be um, advanced, APTs are part of organized crime, advanced persistent threats, but also nation state actors if they're going after somebody. So all of this starts to entail what the threat landscape is like. What are the possible risks to organizations? And the numbers are pretty staggering. Even from 15 years ago, I think uh, it was within one, se you had a new IP address on the internet, usually it took somebody about one second to even note that it was there. And this is 15 years ago. But let's go into some of the the, <laughs> the details here. Um, some of you may have seen this in, in a few places. You know, we reach above 10 trillion in term in 2023 in terms of the amount of cyber crime, but it's estimated to be double that. So this to me is pretty shocking. I remember um, 10 years ago, I was looking up some of the statistics and there was one country and I'm not going to call out the country. They had uh, they were, their seventh largest industry was cyber crime. I'm sure it's their top industry right now, but it's expanding very drastically as this is showing because the reality is, and I hate to say this, but in many cases, crime does pay. So if cybercrime were a country, it's the third largest GDP behind the US and China. Um, healthcare data is worth more in the black market than other types. And there's a lot of other factors that go into it, why healthcare organizations tend to be the target of these kinds of attacks. I mean, it, yes, it's the third, third most targeted sector, but there's more to it than that too. Because you take a credit card, for example, the credit card companies are very good. If somebody's making a purchase and it's not you and they're purchasing, you know, plane tickets all over the world or whatever the case is, the card is compromised. They're jumping very quickly on things. So I remember, and I've uh, talked, been at a couple of different, more than one healthcare conference over the years. You get somebody who's going to walk up there and say, yeah, I was talking to my neighbor uh, and they know somebody down the street who's selling fake IDs, but they're also selling insurance information. So they have a fake ID that happens to go along with a, an insurance card, or they make it look like they're part of it. They're going in and getting surgeries and other things done underneath other people's names in certain cases. Now, I'm a New Yorker, so I heard about this in New York at a New York uh, healthcare conference. But these are definitely some of the impacts. And why, why is healthcare getting to be so expensive? It's because of cybercrime. It's because the mixing of cybercrime and real world crime together to create fraud and a whole bunch of other things that are going along with that. But uh, definitely, it's a big concern. But let's take a look a little bit at the real world impacts. And so this is a, these come from two new sources. These coming up, I think both of them are from 2023. But 88% of healthcare organizations had an attack over the last 12 months. 
So these are serious attacks. These are not, you got an NMAP scan against you, this your basic scan against your organization. The average cost is 4.9 million of an attack. These are pretty staggering. 88% of healthcare organizations and 4.9 million is, is astronomical. Uh, the average cost was 1.3 million for a, a disruption. You know, 54% had an average of four ransomware attacks. This, this to me is extraordinarily concerning right here, just because we know that ransomware has gone up. Um, but you're seeing here that 68% of that said have negatively impacted patient safety and care. Now, I did talk about one case of somebody passing away. It turns out the one case that I cited in the book, it's it wasn't true that they probably would have died anyway because they were rerouted from one hospital to another. But there are cases where people have hacked their own um, systems and then actually end up hurting themselves as a result. So there are some cases where people have died, but it's not common. But negatively impacting patient safety and care they didn't talk about if anybody had died as a result of that. I would have loved to have seen that as an additional uh, metric and what they were looking at. So this statistic I thought was interesting. So those who are paying attention to ransomware attacks, in most of the industry, ransomware attacks are starting to level off a little bit for most industries. But uh, And it did dip a little bit in 2022, and that was partially due to the FBI taking down one of the ransomware gangs. And then Russia has been focusing a lot on Ukraine. So it dipped down, but 2024, it's starting to peak back up again because there's a lot of value that uh, cyber criminals have in terms of dealing with ransomware attacks. Um, but that little dip that we saw, the 278%, that's almost a threefold in increase. That doesn't account for the data that we're seeing from 2022 where it dipped down. This is still a massive attack against healthcare organizations. And I think it's only gonna get worse just taking a look at the data. So this is definitely new to uh, St. Margaret's Health in Spring Valley, Illinois, shut down because of ransomware. I mean, this is extraordinarily serious. It affects people's lives. And uh, the, you know, in many cases, some people buy their um, houses just because they're close to it. If they know they wanna have a family, they wanna make sure they've got a good hospital that's close by they can get to. You know, it's, a, it's definitely a concern. And I'm hoping that this does not happen to any other organizations, but my fear is that it will. So this is updated. Um, but I thought this would be interesting to take a look at here. Uh, this comes in from the 2023 Verizon Data Breach Investigations Report. Um, when you look at the data compromised, it's personal information. So yes, PII in the form of PHI is being compromised. But what's also interesting is credentials. You know, 37% of the data stolen is about credential data that they're getting. And that to me says something. And what we see, there's a lot of brute force attacks, but a lot of organizations are compromised due to credentials. And that's how the attackers are able to get in quite often. They don't have very specific healthcare data that I've been able to dig up around this. But um, when you're looking in general, it can be upwards of 40% of the attacks are successful because you're using already compromised credentials to get in. A credential being a username and a password. But the patterns are also interesting because you're seeing system intrusions. So this is like the hacking and the malware and stuff that's going to be going on with that. There's the basic web application attacks. Um, obviously, for those that have that, there's social engineering. So this is, you know, um, phishing, smishing, vishing, you know, all those type of things. So using social engineering to gain access to an organization. Uh, and miscellaneous errors. And this goes back to, and even Verizon points this out in their data breach investigation report, which they have for years. It's all about, a lot more often than not, it's about the email. Just mistakes are made. There's, they're not doing the appropriate QA. They're not testing things properly ahead of time, all those kind of things. So data gets sent out in an erroneous fashion. So it's unfortunate, but it's part of the truth that hospitals have to contend with. So there's a title in my uh, book called The Short Arm of the Law, and we're going to start to jump into that a little bit here. So you can see here that there's 156 countries, uh, roughly 80% of the countries have cybercrime laws. And this has been improving greatly over the years. And a lot of these are coming in from the Budapest Convention out of Europe. 68 countries, including the United States, have signed it. And what the purpose of that is, is to make sure that the law enforcement, there's laws in the books where countries can go after cyber criminals because if they don't have a law against it, they're not actually a cyber criminal. So that becomes, a, that's been a huge issue, but now you're getting more and more countries with strong cyber crime laws in place and it's starting to change the whole foundation. So when you're looking up some of the FBI statistics related to um, cyber crime when it occurs, it's very low compared to real world crimes. Real world crimes are, more often than not attacked more than, or caught, the perpetrators are caught more often than they will in a cybercrime uh, series. But what's interesting is taking a look at the full spectrum of how the nation states are approaching it. You know, in many cases, you're getting full cooperation. Those are the countries we love. Um, there are two countries, which I'm sure you will uh, be able to guess which two, 
have decided we're not going to go along with the Budapest Convention because we want a more authoritarian approach to dealing with cybercrime. So they've decided to ignore it altogether. But what's interesting is, and I've been to a lot of breach investigation reports over the years and listened to people who are hands on the ground dealing with the cyber criminals or even going after them or working with international law enforcement, et cetera. Um, the people that I've been talking to, the, this, the, the countries quite often are willing to accept the cybercrime. You know, it's like, well, are they attacking our country? Well, no, we're, we're contacting you because they're attacking somebody in our country, not your country. That's eh, okay. We don't care, you know, because they're bringing in money to their country and it's making their country better. So they oftentimes don't care. But what's interesting too is one of the recent turns is um, some countries are even using organized crime to cover up their crimes rather than doing the crimes themselves or, you know, committing the uh, espionage uh, themselves. So they're using that as another method to for uh, denying culpability. So that's a new turn that's happened in the last year or two, but it's definitely concerning. But you start to see why catching the cyber criminals is so difficult in many cases. In some cases, they're given carte blanche access to do whatever they want to whatever countries. In fact, one of the countries that I'm talking about now, um, they decided to attack a college out in Georgia, of all places, uh, the state of Georgia in the United States. And they advertised on their national TV to show off their prowess. Now, having worked in an education institution myself and seeing how bad the security typically is, I wouldn't call that something that I would boast about, but um, you know, they were doing it anyway. It's just an example to their uh, constituents that they're doing a good job. Okay, so we're gonna switch to healthcare technology. So many of us are familiar with the basic stuff. You get physical networks, routers, switches, firewalls, servers. Now you get VMware and all these other types of virtualization technologies that are out there. There's cloud. But the thing is, most of that technology is very centralized. You know, you get something like, for those who are familiar with it, Active Directory. You can change settings across oh, thousands of systems just by changing a few different uh, settings within Active Directory. And that's very powerful. You know, healthcare specific, it's hit or miss. They do have a lot of the centralized traditional IT. So it isn't like that doesn't exist. But when the companies, especially the companies that are selling the IOMT devices, they're going in and they're working with the doctors. They're getting the information with them. Hey, what's working for you? What isn't? And what they're trying to do is really get them on their good side to say, hey, what can we do to improve things for you? And that's how a lot of them end. So Having a sales background, um, it, it's very interesting to see because the most important thing that you can do from a sales standpoint is to become the trusted advisor. If you're on a name by name basis and they're calling you up to ask you basic questions that they didn't know, it's a good thing. So when you're looking at IOMT, the doctors are definitely a big part of that equation and they're gonna be trusting different companies. So they want to work with these products. They want to work with the companies because they're very responsive. There's an issue with the product Oh, well, we didn't think about that. Let's go ahead and fix it for you. It's fixed you know, a week or two later. They look like they're fantastic. And so a lot of doctors get really hooked on working with these healthcare companies. Um, but it's all part of that kind of continued evaluation and being part of the process of working with the doctors and patients. So what's interesting, even some of the large companies that are out there, they are almost acting like a whole bunch of micro companies that are developing the IOMT systems on their own. And so that's part of the process of becoming that trusted advisor. So they're getting in and working with those doctors on a case-by-case -case basis. Not in all cases, but this is part of the process that uh, many of these organizations are using. Um, but the other thing is these systems are deprecated. You know, there's old IoT systems that are out there. There's a lot of issues with that. They may or may not have centralized management. So if you think about a hospital, I'm going to use a small number, well, at least for the New York area, you know, 100 beds, you know, it, that becomes a huge issue because what if you have to make a change on 100 different devices and you don't have this centralized management console to, to manage the changes across the IoT? That means that you have to pay somebody to either A, log in and make the configurations on their own, or they have to physically walk up to the device in some cases to make the changes. That is a painful, painful process and it's an expensive process to go through. A lot of the manufacturers are starting to change. So that's a positive, and they are recognizing the value of having these things, but there's still a long ways to go. And there's still a lot of old systems that are out there from an IoT perspective. Um, usually the IoT, they have connections out to networks, et cetera, and stuff too. But that's in general, that's what we're seeing is the difference between that. And we're going to go do a deeper dive on the IOMT stuff. So uh, just bear with me here. But let's go into the IOMT technology itself, because there's a lot of different things. So we're going to start slow. Um, the operating systems sometimes are pre-built in IoT uh, systems, but then they'll add in a few extra changes from an IoT perspective. 
Sometimes they're going to be a lean operating system. So those who are familiar with Linux, you can install something called packages, where basically you can get the operating system extremely small, which makes it a little bit better. It's going to be operate more quickly. Um, it's going to have less vulnerabilities. There's a lot of reasons why you'd want to use a lean operating system. But in many cases, the operating systems that are installed on the SIOMT devices are full operating systems. So it's a little bit con concerning from that standpoint because the full force of the vulnerabilities are going to start appearing. You know, I quote in the book um, for Windows 7, there are like 1,111 vulnerabilities in Windows 7, which is still out there today. And now those numbers are well above 2,000 and they're not, uh, they're, there are no new patches being created for them with a few minor exceptions. So it's a big concern when you're looking at this stuff. But also you've got gateways, you've got different types of management systems that are out there. Depending on the system, sometimes mobile phones can be part of it or an iPad or some others. Uh, different applications and cloud products uh, can be, all be connected and part of this whole IOMT ecosystem. And to me, that's the important thing when you're looking at this stuff. Uh, IOMT really is an ecosystem. You know, we're going to see that in, in a couple of slides here. So if we're getting into types of medical devices, there's wearable devices. These are, you know, either it's going to be around your neck or it's going to be, you know, a watch or something similar to that. Uh, you've got implanted devices, pacemakers, insulin pumps, you know, et cetera. There's ingestible devices. These are swallow. These are more detection. These are the least concern that I have in terms of the telemedicine. Um, but I've seen a couple cases where it has been a, you know, a, there definitely is a tiny risk there. And of course, there's communication devices if they're using full telemedicine and they're just trying to talk to you over their iPad or other sort of device. And especially there was a break in the result of COVID too with some of the rules. Um, but of course, you have medic stationary medical devices. So I talked about that a little bit, um, you know, you, for the wearable devices, they'll look at your heartbeat, blood pressure, you know, and so on. But a lot of times what they do is they'll sometimes connect into Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, but other times they're going to have um, wireless back to their SaaS application, or in some cases, it might go from the SaaS to the hospital. Implanted medical devices, you know, again, I think I spoke about the hearts and the pump, um, but they're going to have the same thing. They're going to have the ability to connect in over Wi-Fi or, you know, straight up wireless or Bluetooth to connect into a local device in order to operate. It just depends on the manufacturer, and there are thousands and thousands of manufacturers so nobody is an expert in, in all medical devices. It's just not possible. Uh, and then the ingestible that I spoke about. Usually this is through Bluetooth, the communication. So if you're not familiar with any questions, would somebody have a question? Okay. So OWASP came out with something. OWASP is the Open Source Web Application Security Project. And typically they focus on a, a few different things, but they also came out in 2014, the first time, the IoT Top 10 Issues. And they came out with a 2018 version, but they haven't come out with a new one since then. So these top problems that you're going to find are also true for IOMT, not for all IOMT, but, uh, and we're going to touch on going to details on some of these a little bit later, but they have issues like insecure network services. So those who are used to looking at, at compliance or, you know, risks or vulnerabilities, you, know, you might find Telnet, which is a plain text protocol, which means your password is, is not secure when it's going across that network. You know, the interface is not secure for, for if they're part of an ecosystem. So they might be connecting into something, and that's quite often the case when they're doing it. So these systems for IOMT are being built without real security considerations. They might use HTTP rather than HTTPS. And for those who are not familiar with that means, it's, a, it's about having an, the appropriate level of encryption with HTTPS. You know, but if you've got that, do you have the right type of encryption? You know, are you, if you're using like an RC4 cipher, in order to protect that uh, HTTP connection, you're not doing enough to protect your organization um, and enough to protect it. You know, there's lack of secure update mechanisms so they can see what's going on if there are things are being updated, uh, a lot of outdated components, um, insufficient privacy connection. And these are all exact terms that OWASP is using, but I've seen every single one of these in, in devices, medical devices as well. Um, lack of device management, which I spoke about, insecure default settings, you know, so you could be secure, but typically they're not. So you need somebody who understands the basics behind some of these settings in order to get things. And physical harding, hardening is actually important too, because a lot of these devices, you're going to get, you know, between, I'm going to talk about that later, 10 to 15 devices per bed. Um, and if you have a person who's sitting in there, they could decide to futz with them. Or maybe it's not the person sitting in the bed or somebody just walks in and it's like somebody curious, they're going to toy with these things. And this stuff happens all the time. 
Um, in the federal side of the house, there's um, FIPS in, uh, that can be done, but they'd also include FIPS 140-2, but it also can include hardening of the physical system. So if anybody tampers with it, it's going to be very evident if anybody had opened it up. Um, and that's part of what could be done from a physical hardening perspective. But let's go into additional challenges. So I mentioned the 10 to 15 devices per bed, but the other thing, these devices are kept for 15 years. So we're making a lot or sometimes even longer. I've heard of a little bit longer, but 15 years is not unheard of for a lot of devices. Some hospitals are going to have a much faster refresh rate, but it just depends on a lot of different functions, how much money they're putting in. The rural hospitals typically aren't as well funded, so they don't have as much uh, to invest in the infrastructure. And so what you find is 15 years, you know, the average lifespan of a system these days is three, I've seen between three and five years is pretty typical for a piece of hardware before it needs to be replaced. I've seen cases where it's longer, but it's kind of a crapshoot if that system is going to cop out or not. But if you're talking about a, you know, $5 million piece of equipment, you're not going to replace it every year. You know, let's say it's not patching, you know, find another way to deal with it is the attitude. And there's a lot of business sense to that. So when you're looking at, at this, you know, I, I do take the security side of the house because I've been wearing a security hat for 15 plus years. Um, but on the other high side, there's a business side to it. You've got to come up with a different method for being able to protect these devices. So there's a lot of rationale for being able to protect um, organizations and rationale for keeping these things around for 15 years. Um, but the reality is when you're looking at compensating controls or an alternate ways of protecting systems, it's usually time intensive expensive and uh, challenging. You know, it's not easy for a lot of healthcare organizations to deal with that. Um, external challenges, oftentimes there's few options, you know, and this is getting a little bit better, but you know, if you've got a, you've got few options for secure IOMTC systems to purchase, um, you can't install so cybersecurity software on them. So if you've got a Windows device that's sitting out there and you can't in install basic antivirus on it, you can't harden it because you've got to use their particular standards. You can't include file integrity monitoring you know, there's a whole host of issues that come with having these IOMT devices in the organization. So you've got to come up with these indirect methods of being able to detect the problems. And there's a lot of tools out there. Don't get me wrong. It isn't like there's no options. But let's say, for example, if you've got, you um, need to do a packet capture to determine what's going on. So I'm going to talk about Palo Alto a little bit later. But, you know, if you're talking about that, then you need a packet solution around every single location where the information is going to be going through. So you have to make sure, look at the network traffic, take a look at architectural diagram, figure out where we're going to place it. And you might need 10 of these devices or more, depending on the size of the hospital. So these are huge challenges that hospitals have to face because then you have to maintain it. You've got to get new devices. And then when you upgrade the network, then you might need to get a new device for it. So as we start to get new technologies in there and there's more and more traffic, you might need to get a larger size and then you might need to get a larger size device for doing the monitoring. Um, it's, it's a real challenge to, for organizations to straddle all the different challenges related to IOMT. So Palo Alto, um, this came in after my book came out, but this would have been you know pretty interesting statistics, I think, to play with here. Um, but the IoT device, you can see here, you've got infusion pumps, all these kind of things that are out there. But if you're looking at the security issues, that to me is a little bit more interesting. So imaging systems are only 16% of the problem, or 16% of the devices that are out there are imaging system but they are 51% of the security issues. Patient monitoring, 14%, 26% of the issues. The gateways, the medical device gateways, this is where the medical information is going through, 9% of the issues, and they're only 4% of the devices. So to me, this is very interesting, but it does give you kind of a blueprint, blueprint for what approach you should take from like an architecture standpoint and a prioritization standpoint for trying to protect organizations. You find out if you can't, update it, and you've got a lot of other issues with it, VLAN it. And so those who are not familiar with the VLAN, it's a virtual local area network. So it's basically a way of separating one type of device from another type of device, which is good, but it's not everything. You should put in something called an ACL, a firewall ACL. Um, so you put in this VLAN ACL that's in place, it's going to help block it. You know, it takes a lot of time to set up an ACL because you have to monitor what's going on and you know, put this stuff in slowly over time, but it just gives you an idea. Because the reality is some organizations don't even realize what's going on when they put in these devices. So one of the statistics I was looking at, when you're looking at the installation of these devices, more often than not, there is AI being implanted in things. So now you might be getting health information going over to a local artificial intelligence provider that's built into the software that they're installing 
kind of for a different purpose, but it's being added in anyway as an additional feature, and the developer may or may not have read it properly. So you end up with other sorts of unintended consequences when you're looking at healthcare information. So this was also interesting. Um, and of course, I think I forgot to mention in the book too, um, but the FDA, FDA approval of devices can take five or six years. Well, you got to think, well, how long is this particular operating system around? It can be a while. Now, they can update it and get a new version, but sometimes this can cause some issues and they'll be stuck bringing in a non-supported device into an organization. But to me, this is pretty frightening right here. This is also another Palo Alto source. 83% um, of the devices within hospitals typically have no support whatsoever. And you can see here, the Windows, Windows 7 is 56% of the devices that are out there. Windows XP is 11%. You know, Windows XP shouldn't be touching anything these days, but they're embedding it because it's cheap because part of it goes down to the economics. Do you want to pay for that? Like um, a, a buddy of mine actually has IOMT device, not IOMT, but IOT device that they put in. And they were screaming at him because like, well, we need to go to the latest operating system. And they're like, no, we are not going to pay 100 extra dollars. And all he did is took the, the cost from Microsoft and brought it in. It was an extra hundred dollars. We're not paying for it. And they were stamping their feet up and down. So they were demanding a less secure device be in their environment. And the same thing goes on in healthcare organizations, you know, it's it's a cost. And you're hearing this over and over and over again, that there's a cost to it. Well, there's a, obviously a cost when it comes to these breaches that are going on from a ransomware perspective and other perspective. There's a cost to having 83% of your software unsupported. So as I mentioned with Windows 7, I was looking that up again. It's more than double the number of vulnerabilities uh, since I wrote my book, doubled, you know. So that that's that's a real concern because it basically means it's a haven where hackers can sit. They, you know, what are you going to do about it? There's a vulnerability in it. You can't detect it. You have no way of dealing with it. They just get to sit there and do what they want. Now, there are other methods you can use. Hopefully your intrusion detection system and threat intelligence. And I'll go into some of the other solutions that are out there. But um, you can definitely see the challenges though. You know, you don't want hackers sitting in your network for a long period of time. So the IOMT, I spoke about a lot of the issues already, but the open source, you know, more often than not, there's little security oversight in the open source issue. And so standard software development today includes open source tools that are out there. There's insufficient documentation, Many of the packages are compromised. There's a lot of vulnerabilities within them. There's software composition analysis and other things you can do to help stem the tide and try to see what those issues are prior to bringing them in. There's, you know, but uh, definitely there's a lot of issues that are going on. In some cases, uh, you know, I know of a few cases where somebody was um, from another country and they were working with this guy for years and he handed over, said, you know what, I trust you. I think you're doing great. Handed it over to him. And within like a week, he had full administrative access. They couldn't wrestle it away from him. He completely compromised the packages, put all kinds of malware in there because it was so important that everybody was using this package. So this kind of thing is going on in the world today. And it's just, it's just an ugly part of the software development process. So there's a globally interconnected ecosystem, you know, uh, technologies always part of that. So as I said, I, I really like the ecosystem concept when it comes to IOMT and some others. So Obviously, you've got the base operating systems, you've got software that's being installed, some of it's open source, you've got uh, medical data that's going through there. Um, all of these things are connecting together to be part of a, a larger issue. But there's with those complex issues, every single one of those systems has to be configured and set up right. You have to do the penetration testing. You have to have the right level of security for like the app you're going to install on your phone, or maybe the software as a service needs to be set up properly. And would you do that? There's always more risk that goes in. You know, there's a different types of wireless protocols that have been broken over the years. You know, I've seen systems where they're using a deprecated wireless protocol. Um, and why would you do that in a modern age? But those kind of things um, are part of what we're dealing with from a cybersecurity perspective. And it's no wonder that hospitals are being compromised when they're stuck in the middle of this situation because you're going to have far more IOMT devices in most hospitals than you will in other cases. This is really severe from my perspective. So how did we get here? So I do talk about this in my book, and I quote from the same, same place. And this is circa 2016. Um, one college out of the 36 top schools required a single cybersecurity course to graduate. One out of 36. And these are on computer science programs. And three of the top 10 colleges had no cybersecurity electives for a computer science program. You know, and this is in 2016. You think we would have been a little bit more progressive at that time from a cybersecurity perspective. Um, Three of the Business Insider's top 50 colleges 
required a cybersecurity course to graduate, you know, and, and I do know that there are, because I, I know people who are actually teaching today that there are a lot more cybersecurity courses that are out there. So it has changed. But if you take a look at the business leaders, they're walking in and they don't have a clue about cybersecurity. I'm working with business leaders now. They're building all this stuff and setting up everything and they don't have a clue. It's like, uh, what do I do? Cybersecurity, it's a bunch of scary stuff, you know? And I'm trying to get you into the heads for those who are not used to working with business executives. They don't know what to think, but they're scared, you know? But in other cases, they're like, ah, who cares? It wasn't brought up in high school. I know better than you. I'm, I'm a business guy. You get those kind of attitudes that kind of come up related to cybersecurity as a result of never having any education in it. The, the way that a lot of people in the past have gotten their education is walking into a corporation that happened to have done cybersecurity. So you've got to use these alternate sources to get the security information. Now there's a lot more sources that are out there. There are places you can go through to research it. There are all kinds of YouTube channels to go to. We heard a lot about them as, as the start of the program today, but uh, there are definitely some options that are out there. But the other side of the house is IOMT really is valuable. It's not being created for random reasons. You know, It saves lives and reduces costs. For example, um, if you have a sensor that's sitting on your wrist and it's checking to see what's going on, a lot of times we don't know what the macro, we'll get a macro symptom, but the device is able to detect something before the macro symptom actually manifests itself. And they can send a um, ambulance over to deal with somebody or help them prior to becoming extremely serious or be able to respond to something very serious much earlier. That's huge. That's a clear example right now where we're able to save money because that person might've been on life support for the rest of their life, but because somebody was there to deal with a heart attack or some other things, we're much safer than we ever were in the past. Um, so obviously you get better uh, convenience, better outcomes. IOMT is here to stay. It's not going away. I don't want it to go away. I think it's exciting, some of the stuff that's happening. And the fact that you have people now that are able to live full lives because of IOMT, it's it's fantastic. And what the doctors and manufacturers are doing is, is absolutely wonderful. I just would like to see us move more faster from a cybersecurity perspective, just because there are some issues with that. This is getting into the supply chain attacks. I talked about how bad it is, but you're seeing here that even in the last few years, like I wrote mine in 2019, they weren't seeing a lot of malicious packages, at least from Sonotype here, but it's up to 245,000 malicious packages that they were able to catch in 2023. And this was done, I think I pulled this out like November, December information. So it's not quite all of 2023. But it's enough to give you the general idea, black box argument. Um, I will admit, I, I'm guilty of using this myself. And this kind of argument has manifested itself in all kinds of situations. But you're going through an audit. Well, you can't tell us what device to get. This is the best device for us. This is what's going to save the most lives. And so what's happening is, in some cases, cybersecurity is pitted against somebody's life. And, and how do you argue against something like that? You know, and that's where you're dealing with things up at the CEO level or some of the others that are in there. It's hard to make those arguments. Um, for those of you who have uh, cybersecurity certifications like CISA, CRISC, CISSP, there's a bunch of others. But what's the most important thing? It's human life. Human life is more important than a cybersecurity uh, doohickey. And they teach us that. That's part of the credo that we have to follow as a result of getting certifications. Um, I guess I didn't mention too, I've got 20 some certifications or something like that. But you get the point behind this, that that black box argument, auditors oftentimes, and there's no HIPAA audit, just to be very clear, it's a law, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of 1996. It is a law. But um, th when you're doing different types of certifications, a lot of times the auditors say, you know what, we're not going to get into that argument, we'll back away. And they're going to allow that to be there, which perpetuates the problem, because then the vendors who have the issues, they're not incentivized to do anything because it's accepted. Now, you can go back and argue with the vendors. I've gone down that road route myself, but it takes a lot of time and effort to go down that argument. And some, some are happy to comply, others not. It just depends on the organization and what it is that you're referring to. Um, but it definitely is a, a big challenge. It goes along with the, well, it's always been done this way. So why do we need to change? You know, it's one of the attitudes you, you see with um, trying to move away from some of these older IOMT systems as well. So in the end, and I'm not going to go into it, I think we're probably running a little bit long here, 
um, we're ending up with the perfect storm. There is a lot going on here. You have the device longevity, you have a flat network. So a flat network means that you have the IOMT and traditional IT devices will oftentimes intermingled on the same network. So you've got these devices that hackers are sitting in, they wait for a new vulnerability to come out, they go hack another device, they get in there. And so when you're looking at modern attack methods, sometimes the viruses in the malware, they're going to create a new malware or it's going to mutate. So it cannot be detected even by the individual systems that are out there. So you've got to use the alternate methods to go detect things. In fact, when you look at the antivirus vendors themselves, some of the best ones are not actually doing the old school scanning because that doesn't work anymore. Um, what they're doing is they're looking for a trigger for something that's going to be something unusual or it's going to connect into um, a, some some of their threat intelligence and say, hey, we've got an issue here. And then it's going to respond and go after that uh, particular software within their environment, the malware within their environment. Um, but you can see here this this network segmentation, and this is a little bit updated from 20, uh, for 2020, but mixed VLANs are at 72%. That means in most hospitals, you've got this massive number of IOMT devices mixed in with standard IT to create a lot of challenges. Now, I'm going to pick on one thing. Um, I do think that the fines related to HIPAA, Health, uh, Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, are weak. And the argument goes, well, if we, if we have heavy fines, we're not going to be able to get the work done in order to protect us. So we need to have weak fines. But the reality is most organizations, unless there's strong fines, they're going to consider the fines to be part of the cost of doing business. At least that's been my experience in you're working with things. But if there's a much higher fine associated with that, like GDPR was great, more companies are trying to move towards the European model uh, of uh, trying to meet the GDPR requirements because the fines are so hefty. In fact, it was interesting. The moment GDPR hit, a lot of companies decided, you know what, we're blocking Europe because we're not ready and they don't want to get sued. So... Um, I do think that the HIPAA fines would be a boon overall, but I can understand how it would be a burden. Um, but th this is just part of how I start to look at things because the reality is business people look at cybersecurity and quite often IT is a cost center and not a value generator. And so part of what I do when I walk into organizations, I try to get them to see that it is a value generator because a lot of companies, if you're trying to share that information or give it from point A to point B, you better have some really good security. When you're looking at third-party risk, it, the whole landscape has changed, especially due to a lot of the privacy regulations throughout the United States today. And uh, the companies are getting more knowledgeable about cybersecurity and what the approaches that they can take. So some other challenges, uh, the business requirements, you know, in some cases it's 24 seven, 365 uptime. When you've got an emergency room, a lot of times they want, they don't want you to take down any IOMT device. Then you could go to the argument and say, well, is this really needed? Uh, can we just do this one device over here? No, it's just done because it's the emergency room and that's the argument. So you've got to find ways of slowly bringing people around, going out to lunch and get past the arguments in order to get things done from a cybersecurity perspective, even when you're working within organizations. Um, many times they're going to say, well, no, we don't, we don't want that. We can't have it updated because if we update the operating system, it'll be out of warranty and they're not going to support us anymore. That's really built into the way some of the manufacturers operate today. So you're going to end up with thousands of vulnerabilities on the local device. And that is not the best approach either. Um, they're concerned. There's always a possibility the system won't work properly if you upgrade it. And so they won't be able to keep it on for 15 more years or 10 more years or whatever the story is. So they don't want it to be upgraded anyway. So you get this kind of business resistance to doing the right thing and protecting IOMT. Um, you know, sometimes they don't want passwords. And the reality is in a, in a healthcare organization, in many cases, the passwords go on sticky notes in the organization right on top of the IOMT. Because imagine you're in an emergency room situation and you got you, you threw in the password situation that's there. The doctor has to, oh, let me get on my phone. Okay, oh, are there? and they have to go in and type in the password to go in. But meanwhile, they're no longer sterile. They have to go in and wash their hands, put on a new set of gloves and to make sure that they can gain access to things. It doesn't make any sense. You know, nobody in their right mind is going to want to see a situation where a doctor stuck doing that. And it's like, I could have saved their life, but I had to wash my hands. Just doesn't swing it. I mean, this is the reality of what hospitals are, are, are facing today. And these are for very good reasons. I'm not trying to say that uh, security should trump everything because it shouldn't. Security does have its place, but it's what can we do? Um, 
management configuration. You can't install, I already mentioned, you can't install the uh, configure protective software. A lot of times you can't make these little tiny configuration changes to make it better. So like for those who are familiar with vulnerability management, a good chunk of the vulnerabilities are all about configurations. And then of course, lack of centralized management. Um, so you end up with manual configurations in uh, many cases. So um, I found this, this is the, uh, this picture on the side. It's, it's kind of showing where a lot of cybersecurity professionals are at because it's, it's almost painful dealing with some of the IOMT devices that are out there. Again, not all devices are this way, but it, it still gives me a little bit of amusement to know the pain that I've had to deal with in different organizations. Um, you find hard-coded passwords, meaning they're going to have one password in there. It might be, I've seen password as a password with all lowercase that you just have to type in password to get in. You know, it is crazy some of the stuff that you see out there with some of the IOMT devices and it's hard-coded. Well, how, if it's easy for us to get past it, how easy do you think it is for a hacker to gain access to it? It is extraordinarily easy. You know, many times a short or easily guessable password for the reasons that I spoke about before. Um, those who are familiar with like things like Active Directory, and for those who are not, I should say, uh, you can have centralized access to systems to, that will change the password automatically or the rotate, all the different password controls you can imagine. Um, that they, the IOMT is not connecting into that. And some of them do, I'm not going to tell you that they don't, but a lot of them don't. And that means you you're stuck with the passwords, uh, that you've got, uh, in many cases, or if you have to do it, change the passwords manually, what if somebody fat fingers something and it's an emergency situation? Well, that's a problem too. You don't necessarily want to have somebody spending their whole job to do nothing but change passwords on IOMT devices. It's, it's a big challenge today. Uh, unencrypted connections, you know, password from the clear text. MFA, we've spoken about that. There's all kinds of issues that are going with that. Now, vulnerability management. Now, I'm I'm old enough to have been around when vulnerability management was, you didn't have an agent that was installed. You had to use this external scanning. And for those who are used to the ports, there are you know 65,535 TCP ports and 65,535 UDP ports. So you have to scan the whole system to find out what's going on. Yes, you can use the well-known ports and there are some other strategies that you can use to try to limit it. Um, but sometimes the malware is not going to be on those convenient ports from a, from a well-known perspective. So what do you do? How do you handle something like this? So you can't install an agent on many of these devices. Um, agent-less scanny, scanning has a lot of issues. And sometimes even the agent-less, if you have to take a look at the particular vendor, but they're going to temporarily install an agent and then remove the agent in order to do the scanning. Sometimes you can get away with it with some of the IOMT devices, sometimes not. But sometimes what you're forced to do is use the network data collection to have that additional device in place that has those additional costs that I've already spoken about. Um, penetration testing. I spoke briefly about red teaming, you know, att attacking a, uh, assuming the position of a known attacker on the network, deciding to attack an IOMT device, it's dangerous. You know, there's a possibility you could take the system down. And what if you're doing it at a time? Like there's certain areas of a hospital that are not a concern at all. You know, you can go you know, pen test them at night if they're during the day, if it's in a sleeping center, there's all kinds of exceptions to it. But, you know, a lot of times those devices, they don't want them to be, to have a penetration test against them. And they don't pay for an extra device to have the penetration testing done. So you oftentimes have a reporting issue. So some of the best devices out there that are looking at things from a network perspective are designed to know what's going on in the medical space community pull in that information, they see what the different issues are, and they go from there. But it's then you can kind of assume what the vulnerabilities are. And the same thing is used over in the SCADA world and ICS world, et cetera. So there's, so the, there's a lot of synergy between the different IoT platforms that are out there, but you start to see all this stuff gets to be a challenge. So data protection, I mean, this is almost a joke at this point. Obviously, system-based DLP, data loss prevention tools, you can't have that because you can't install it. In some cases, it's it's just impossible because it's an IoT device and you can't install things that way. But other times it's because the warranty will be voided simply because we have um, a software in there that we don't want anybody to touch. So what you're finding is sometimes the data at rest, which is one of the key things, uh, and data in motion, those are the two key things to focus on. The data is unencrypted. And so if it's unencrypted, that's a HIPAA violation right there. You're not encrypting the data. It's kind of this 101 thing. I was thrilled walking into an organization and the CIO said, I'm encrypting all the databases day one. I'm like, fantastic. That made me so happy. I was absolutely thrilled that they that the CIO had the foresight to try to do that. It's one battle I didn't need to get in the middle of. You know, I already had the buy-in from the CIO that this 
need to be done prior to starting in that particular organization. Um, so there are some successes in the network world when it comes to DLP, but there's definitely some challenges if you're talking about network-based DLP as well. So some systems have it, some don't. There are other things you can purchase to put network-based DLP in place, but it definitely has some, some issues. So incident response is also affected by some of the challenges in IoT. A lot of times you don't have logs. And so if you're not familiar with the concept of a SOC, it is a security operation center. This is where you pull the information, you take the logs from multiple sources, whether it be you know firewalls, intrusion detection systems, operating systems. Um, you pull in all of the, this information in, hopefully from an IOMT device, but in some cases, yes, some cases, no. And you try to determine what's going on and they, they look at it. So when I look at a SOC, I look at the, them at three levels and I'm being very cartoonish here, but it's aggregation, correlation, and analytics. And for those who are familiar with like the MITRE attack framework or threat intelligence, that's all got to be part of this too. That's part of the analytics, uh, just so it doesn't, so you get a sense that I know a little bit about what I'm talking about here. But um, the passive detection methods are typically what's being used. And they're trying to see, is anything happening on the network? Well, for those of you who are pen testers, you know you can do some slow drip attacks to uh, try to get past a lot of the sensors. You know, one thing happens, eh, it's not a, not a big deal, and it may be ignored. And so using this quiet, slow method can sometimes get past a lot of the defenses of an organization, depending on the type of software they're using and, and what they're doing. Um, but anyway, you get you get the issue with that. But I've also seen it in some cases like, yeah, we know it's compromised. We don't want to take it down. Because that we just spent, you know, $4 million in that device. If we go through and do anything to it, we're not going to be able to take that system down right now because it's going to impact business. And we can't afford $4 million to go purchase a new piece of equipment. Okay. You, again, you've got to find another method to approach some of those business challenges that come up. I mean, this is an ugly world, it you know, but it also happens in other areas too. This is not just directly related to healthcare. This happens in other, other, uh, verticals as well. It's something that I've had to deal with in multiple verticals, this sort of challenge, because they want to see things up and running. You talk about what's the impact going to be, you explain it to them to your blue in the face, they're just not going to get it. I mean, there's negligence that's there, but it's an ugly card that the security professionals are oftentimes in the middle of. So, but there's hope, you know, with all the negativity that's out there. And I know I've, I've presented some here from a cybersecurity perspective. To me, there's a lot of great stuff. I've already spoken a little about HIPAA. Great high tech came in there and they gave HIPAA teeth. So they started giving some fines and things are going to be getting a little bit worse too. Uh, the California Privacy Rights Act, um, which is uh, Cal the California, uh, uh, forgetting the name of it now, uh, the original one, but CPRA is in addition to uh, CCPA. And what they do is it's changed for California residents. Now, anything you can de from a federal perspective, you can anonymize HIPAA data and get that information out there and sell it. And then you can, uh, some of the big data people can go through and analyze the data and say, oh, we know this belongs to so-and-so. So if they know it's belonging to so-and-so, uh, that data is still cons is, is not HIPAA data, except if you're a California resident. Because the moment you do that, you become a California resident or the moment they do that, the California resident data becomes HIPAA data once again. So it's treated more severely than it is others. And you, many of you can see in the right-hand column there, uh, the Department of Justice and FBI are treating attacks on healthcare as threat to life. And to me, that's a good step, you know, and it means that it's going to be accelerated some, but obviously it's not enough. We have a lot more to do. There are a lot of other challenges. Now I've been through high trust. It's another uh, framework, uh, but a lot of, a lot of um, ports, if you're following high trust, it's going to be the equivalent of being HIPAA. Now, there's a lot that goes into that and, and goes into it. I don't necessarily recommend that for all companies because there's, there's a learning path when it comes to high trust and it is painful to go through. Um, and it's not easy. It is one of the more complex frameworks and it's growing all the time. So like, for example, when I was doing it, we went from 9.0 of the high trust model and we had a lot of data. We're pulling in like over a million records per day and it was advertised on the website, what we were doing. Uh, and it was part of the build. So we would pull in more than a million records a day. We went from 500 controls up to 600 controls between 9.0 and 9.1. So it is very tough. And I've seen as few as about 250 controls, but my information's a little bit dated on high trust. But you get the idea. There's a lot that goes into uh, some of the frameworks that are out there. Now, UL2900, I find really interesting. Um, this was brought about because the Veterans Administration said, we want to take a look at what's, we've got to find another route because we've got all these insecure devices. We simply cannot accept it. And they're the largest 
purchaser because they're the largest medical provider in the United States. So what they did is they par did a public private partnership to try to figure out how can we start to secure things properly. And what came out of that is UL 2900. A UL is a laboratory. They do a lot of different things, um, but now medical device security is one of those things. So if you're going to purchase medical devices, UL 2900 is one of the options that you have. And if the Veterans Administration is using it, it's going to be a lot more secure than a lot of these others. And that's something even down the road, it's going to help protect you. I highly advise going down the UL 2900 route if it's an option for your organization. Of course, that doesn't deal with the older software and IoT devices and IOMT devices that are in your, in your organization, but at least it's a step in the right direction. In a few years, you might be a lot more secure than you are now. Um, I didn't talk about PACs. I'm not going to go into that too much, but that's an, uh, it's a new regulation that was up, which is why this is interested. But then you see like the health industry security practices that are out there. Um, HHS has to, just recently came up with the cybersecurity performance goals, which I think are great. But the reality is, is I, you know, I've, I've seen various models come out over the years related to healthcare regulation. If you're not even doing HIPAA properly, a lot of this stuff doesn't make sense. These are just kind of 101 from, if I guess, because I've been in the industry for so long and I've dealt with so many compliance frameworks. I've dealt with like 15, 20, I don't even know how many different compliance frameworks. And I'm still learning new frameworks. New things keep popping up I'm not even aware of. Um, but it's just so basic what's in both of these that companies really should be doing that. Um, the FDA has also come out with their version of the software bill of materials. So for those who are um, not familiar with software bill of materials, it's basically because there's a lot of vulnerabilities in software, you need to advertise those. So if you think about Log4j, which came out a couple of years ago, um, <clears throat> that was a huge issue and it was built into a lot of software. And so knowing whether or not that software actually is vulnerable or if the vulnerable vulnerability management tool that you're using is just picking up on it and it's there, that's an issue. Now, sometimes that it really is not protected, but how does an individual know that? Because a lot of companies are going to go in there from an IOMT perspective or even from standard software perspective and say, nope, you're completely good and you don't have anything to worry about. It's so buried. It's not even software that's really being used. So I, I you have to get a pen tester in your organization to go after it and see if they can compromise it or not. Because the challenge with a lot of them with agent-based vulnerability management tools is what they're doing is they're scanning for any remnant of it. And this is a frustration I've had with it, but it's still, you know, 99% good, but you find some cases where it isn't. You know, you find a remnant left over from Adobe Acrobat, for example, because there's a registry entry in Windows saying that there's something there. Therefore, you've got an issue. Um, it's not an issue if you have just a registry entry and everything else has been deleted. And, and so sometimes it takes a lot of due diligence and time on the part of cybersecurity teams to go figure out what's going on, that this ends up being a, a huge challenge. But you get the point here. This stuff is not easy. It takes a lot of time and due diligence. And one of the things that's different from cybersecurity compared to IT, it's the amount of due diligence you do. We Both IT and security do due diligence. Security tends to be a little more, more heavily focused on the due diligence side of the house just to make sure that things are right. And are people actually telling you the truth? A lot of times you don't know. But there's some future regulations that are coming out. Um, the Biden administration is starting to tackle the open source software issue. Um, I don't know what that's going to look like. I'm excited to see what's going to happen. Um, Kathy Hochul, uh, the governor of New York, which is where I'm at, is starting to take a look at some new regulations uh, related to healthcare facilities. And I'm really excited too, because the Biden administration is focusing on uh, IoT regulations as well. So they're going to be putting letter grades on devices. So, and, and this is a really big deal. So cybersecurity teams, what they've had to do in the past is, well, let's do a complete analysis. Let's find out which of these items are an issue. You know, would you give an A letter grade to an IoT device if you couldn't patch it? Probably not. Um, I personally wouldn't. I would not give that an A. A B if they did everything else perfectly at best, but not being able to patch it means you're prone to possibly thousands of vulnerabilities over a period of years. Um, so when you start to take a look at these things, there's a little bit more coming in from the health and human services side of the house as well. But when you look at it, there's a lot of good reasons here, because I think ultimately what this is going to do, it's going to start to put a little bit more pressure on the manufacturers to start doing a better job at the IOMT. Now, they have been moving in a good direction and uh, not fast enough, but there's some good things that are coming out of that. So I think that's incredibly valuable. So what can you do if you're a company? <laughs> the letter grades I spoke about, it speaks for itself, the UL2900. Um, I happen to be a big fan of something called cyber risk quantification. I think that not enough cybersecurity professionals out there are focusing on it. 
today, I actually aligned myself to a lot of the cyber insurance side of the house because that's where my training, my focus has been. Um, but the cyber risk quantification is like, how do you translate? Oh, it's high risk. Well, everything's high risk, you know? And so the naysayer is going to say, well, I, you've got a high risk vulnerability. Well, what does that mean? And then you've got to sit down and explain that. And organizations that are less mature, where you need to get people on board to understand that, you need to speak in business terms. And there's a lot of tools out on the market today that are helping with that whole effort towards that cyber risk quantification. And there's there's so much to it. Some of them are more advanced than others, and there's a lot of considerations that are going into it. Some are more transparent than others. So there's a lot that goes into that, and it's a whole topic of conversation that I could get into just separate from this. But you start to see where the different challenges are from, from that. But if you're not speaking the language of business and saying, yep, it looks like we've got 1,600 vulnerabilities, business people look at you like you've got two heads. What are you talking about? You know, and it depends on the organization. How did you mature them and train them? And you go to a board of directors, like, what does this really mean in business value? So like, for example, with risk, and I happen to, risk happens to be my favorite topic out of cybersecurity. I, I, I love risk. Um, you know, say, well, it's a $10 million risk. Well, it's never going to happen. So who cares? Well, if you take a look at the cyber crime, how much it's going up, you take a look at where we're at from a maturity standpoint, I'm a big fan of maturity models and things like that within cybersecurity. And you say, yeah, it's a $10 million risk. But with cybercrime going up, I expect this to happen at least once per some once over the next year, over the next 10 years. There's a there, that they're going to listen with a little bit different ear because it's there, it becomes from this far off possibility into something that's a little more likely and like, oh, I don't want to lose a million dollars. Great. Can we invest uh, you know, a hundred thousand dollars a year extra in cybersecurity? Because that'll make up to the million dollars, but you're still looking at that million dollar risk at some point. Um, there's just so many different things you can do to look at things strategically within organizations that that's where I find this interesting. Um, helping with the prioritization efforts, sometimes that's tied into cyber risk quantification for another discussion. Um, but invest in threat, health and healthcare threat intelligence. Um, I have gotten some great feedback. And one of the things I've done, for example, um, is I've pulled in threat intelligence from an, like an information sharing analysis center. There's a health ISAC, information sharing analysis center where you can pull in that information, then you can throw it up into your intrusion detection system. You throw it up into your uh, secure email gateway. You put it into your secure web gateway. There's all these different things that threat intelligence can be useful for. It can be helpful from a forensic standpoint to determine what's going on within an organization. So there, there's definitely a lot uh, to tie in there. But uh, then you've got, you know, take a look at your robust security posture. You know, what are you doing? What can you do to improve your processes? You know, uh, do you have the appropriate level of trust in your organization to start building and securing things properly? In some cases, the answer is yes. In some cases, no. But you've got to start building that culture. As security leaders, we've got to be the ones that are focusing on building that culture within an organization to start doing the right things to get people going in the right direction. So IOMT manufacturers, um, as I said, it's getting better. And I did start to see this. So one of the things I don't talk about in the book is there is a gentleman out there, I'm forgetting his name right now, and I've met him, um, who did I Am the Cavalry. And eventually I was at a Black Hat conference, a packing conference several years ago, and he had a whole panel that was out there and, and his tone had changed. You know, I said, and he said, like, we, we are the cavalry. And what was interesting about that is a lot of people were in the same boat. It wasn't just one person that were doing that, but he was able to pull in one of the manufacturers into that. Uh, I'm not going to say who it was, but it was nice to see that whole change in the attitude. And that, so that sh to me showed a very small shift in the industry. So all these little things that are going on, I think are ultimately going to start affecting the level of security, not only when it comes to just IOMT and IOT and some of the other associated but it's going to start to change how we approach security within organizations because there's a real monetary impact as a result of not having sufficient uh, uh, security. And IOMT just plays a, a big part of that for many organizations. So that's it for my presentation. Um, but thank you very much for listening. Um, I'm happy to take questions and hear what people have to say. Um, I have a question. Sure. So I, I'm a student. I'm very new to many cybersecurity things, but I also work as remote IT and my company focuses mainly on hospitality clients. They do have a couple small medical offices. And the issue that I'm seeing with my hospitality clients anyways is um, there are just so many, there are so many cooks in the kitchen that sometimes security incidents alerts 
are not followed up on frequently um, people. And also, you know, sometimes these alerts, since he, I remember you saying that email was such a huge source of uh, incidents in medical settings, um, you know, people just tend to ignore the alerts until something goes heinously wrong. And then they expect like, oh, one person's handling it, it all. And it, there's like, our company is different from the email threat monitoring company who's different from their management company. So what do you think would be the best step forward to, I don't know, either get cybersecurity specialists more like respect and authority or to limit, I don't know, how would you resolve an issue as rampant as that? So I think there's a lot of things that are going on there in, in your specific case, and it may vary depending on the institution. So... When you talk about the alerts that are going on, and there's too many of them, that's a that's a huge issue. Um, but, but this is where appropriate reporting has to go on. But also, I think that there's a fundamental technology gap. So I think I briefly mentioned the MITRE attack framework. And what's happened is there are so many companies that have jumped on the MITRE attack framework bandwagon. And I think it's a positive thing. I think it's fantastic. And for those who are not familiar with it, um, Basically, what they've done is they've itemized all the different types of attacks into a huge taxonomy, and it's got all these different things under different areas. Here's privilege escalation, blah, 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 and they show all these different things. So what's happened is the security operations centers are trying to focus on everything. And what's happened is with some of the SOCs that I've had to deal with and change, um, and you've got to get people thinking about things from a different standpoint, they want to alert on everything. And like I walked into a situation as a chief information security officer at one point. Um, and what happened was they were they had one guy who was going through. So you had benign true positives that were in place. They literally had so many alerts that they had a full time person. Did you do this? Did you do this? Did you do? This? And it, it's it's painful to see those kind of processes go on. And I said, how much value are we getting from looking at each and every single one of these possible alerts? Well, it could be something. Well, yes, it could be. But take a look at the right data. You know, for example, something like privilege escalation is something that typically isn't going to happen all the time, except for in the largest of organizations, you know, where they're bringing in new IT people or whatever. Um, those you do need to follow up on if it's privilege escalation. But if it's an administrator logging into a server, don't you think that's a little bit ridiculous to follow up on? Um, and so there's got to be some more intelligence about our approach to things. And so I'm a big fan of something called the Scientia Institute. Um, and truth be told, Wade Baker... I used to work with because I used to work at Verizon with him. So I was used to hearing all about their threat intelligence and things like that. So just putting my cards on the table, but they're doing some really brilliant work by trying to focus on what are the ones that are more commonly used in attacks. And it's a very small percentage of the MITRE attack framework, typically speaking. But the reality is, and I've, I've both brought in multiple security operation centers, work with multiple security operation centers. I've sold security operation center services. Um, it's a challenge. Not everything is done properly from a security operations center perspective, and they're scrambling to go get the right information in there. So part of it, and this is where it takes a lot of intelligence and thoughtfulness, but what they'll do is they'll show you, hey, we're at 60% of the MITRE attack framework. And then a quarter later, they're going to be at 65% and they're showing their progress. And, you know, because you've got to get this across, you know, in some cases, thousands of different sources. Uh, and, and that's a big challenge when you've got a, a decent sized organization is trying to pull that in. And the reality is when you're looking at IOMT devices, most SOCs aren't trained to look at all these different IOMT devices. They don't know what to do with the data. They don't know what's an issue and what isn't an issue for organizations today. So um, I think there's a lot of cleanup that needs to happen. And yes, you're seeing artificial intelligence showing up in how to handle security operation centers. But I think that we need to be more intelligent in the approach that we're taking to cybersecurity today. But on the other hand, um, I do think that security is not given the attention that it that it should be. So I'm a big fan of paying attention to what's going on. I'm a lot of different uh, chief information security officer circles. And one, of the, and one of the statistics that I've been following for years is CISO longevity in organizations. Typically, it's pretty short, you know, and you're seeing everything. I think when I first became a CISO, it was like 17 months. When I left three years later, it was, average lifespan was 24 months. But it's gone up to like gone down to like two years, and it's like I've seen fourteen months, uh, which is not uncommon. There definitely is a, a a real problem there from a leadership perspective, and I think that the the issues are multifold. Now there are the there are the extremes on one side that say, oh, security leaders they just need to 
uh, talk business and that's what their issue is. Get out of here, you know, and there's that attitude that's out there. But now what's happening is, and you're seeing things in some of the regulations. So for example, New York DFS, New York Department of Financial Services, uh, one of the questions that, they, that you have to answer as a CISO, and I've worked in DFS as well. I've worked with a lot of different compliance areas, but DFS has a requirement that says, that the, you have to say and approve that you have sufficient resources to get the job done. And what's also interesting is with the latest changes that are going on within NYDFS, uh, you also have to have the CEO sign off on it. And so when you're seeing these types of events going on, I think that it, it's starting to shift things in the wrong direction, but the CISO needs to take the time to show him or herself as a business leader within the organization and speak their language, you know? And I think that's incredibly important today um, that they do that. But on the other hand, you know, when you look at things, well, I don't respect you because you you, won't, you don't know the cybersecurity stuff. Well, you know, there's a lot that security leaders have to learn. They've got to learn to speak that language. And there's a lot of great books out that, that start to talk on that subject. And there's a lot of other people that are going in that direction. And that's part of the reason why I'm such a big fan of cyber risk quantification, because it's starting to move the needle in the right direction in terms of getting the right communication across to the business leaders. Because you need to convince the business leader, here's what the risks are. Um, and I work with a lot of uh, interesting companies on the side too, that they want to quantify what the risk is, but from a different standpoint. Oh, well, you have people standing around not doing anything or people aren't coming in. What is the dip to revenue during that time and be able to analyze it and take a look at it from a different standpoint. And all this stuff is going on right now. That's why I pay attention to cyber insurance so much because they've got this information quantified. And so like when I'm doing a risk assessment, I try to bring that cyber insurance model to the table and map it over to what's being done. What are the gaps in their program? What are the percentages of IOMT to other devices? How much are you actually scanning? And, and the other thing too, like that's, that's another issue. Some of the vulnerabilities that you're finding, I did a scan uh, fairly recently it was something like um, there were there were a lot of vulnerabilities. I don't remember the exact numbers that were from 1999. Now that's when the common vulnerability database came into uh, play is 1999. And so these systems, they're just not being built very intelligently today from an IOMT perspective. You want to deal with it. Well, it's already hacked if you've got a vulnerability on there from 1999 and it was built you know somewhat recently. And this is true for a lot of IoT systems today. So it's a, it's a big challenge. But I think that there's got to be um, this sort of blending approach, but trying to get to the level of maturity that I'm talking about. I know people even at big banks and some others, they're striving to get that level of maturity that they can get that reporting up there. It's not always easy. So it takes a lot of time to develop that maturity in organizations. And I think the business leaders have to be a little bit patient. So yes, if you go in there, some people are going to tear you to shreds if you go in there and talk about vulnerabilities. But in other cases, um, if you go in there and speak the language, and at least it's going to help a little bit. But business leaders, I think, have to be a little bit more patient and understand what the risks are and understand like, hey, we have to build up towards cyber risk quantification. We can't just snap our fingers and get it done. Does that help at all? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. I have a lot of terms that I've typed into tabs in Google <laughs> and I will so much reading later. <laughs> so thanks. Great. Hey, Matthew, Jonathan, I'm a great presentation. Uh, thank you very much. You you keep mentioning, and as a CISO, I've been struggling with this recently, is quantifying risk in a way that the executives will understand. And everything you're saying is just ringing very loudly and true to me right now. So you mentioned the insurance models. Is there like a specific model like FAIR? Is there something that you're really adhering to or, or leaning towards? Are you leveraging several different models? Just curious. So... I, truth be told, I used to work at a company that was selling cyber insurance. So I got an education there. I was really working with them. And I was actually a global CISO in that particular role. So I was pulling in stuff for all kinds of different companies. And I understand how the models and what they look like and what the approach is. So I, I'm working off a lot of the data sets that they have for that. And they use some different techniques than what you're what we hear. We hear some information that just clouded isn't true, like cost per record. Mm -hmm. That's not how the cost really comes about. But if you read every single breach report, you know, that's coming out there, and I'm not going to poo-poo any of them, um, they're telling you, oh, it's cost per record. And yes, you can do that. You can take a million, uh, a million dollars or whatever, you can divide it per record and get a number out of it. But that doesn't make it an accurate number. And that's part of the challenge that uh, I see is trying to do that. So the other thing too, is, is sometimes people are not going to believe you. So so the insurance is one side of the house. I pull in the insurance. I'm not going to give away all the magic and stuff that I work with, 
but because that's part of the service, one of the services that I work with and resell, but it's, um, you know, tying it to some other things. You know, I, I'm a big fan of business impact assessments. I've been doing those for many, many years. And I think they are very enlightening because usually people underestimate the amount of effort it's going to take to rebuild something. We have, whether it's from a technology standpoint, what it's going to take, oh, you just slap in a few things and you get some manager who's going to take a look at things and not really look at them in depth to understand the level of problems that you're going to run into from that perspective. Um, but there's a lot of different methods, but you know, it's not always going to work. I mean, I, I've had to use kind of a combination of different methods. Like one of the things I did, and I might do a talk on this on my own at some point, is I kind of mix my own model, tie it into like this CSF and some other things and use this in combination. Look, here's your risk. Here's, here's the inherent risk and here's the residual risk as a result of taking a look at the security you have in place. Out of a five security, you know, using CMMI, which I'm sure you're familiar with, um, and for others, it's a capability maturity model. They've got basically it's a model one to five, or zero meaning you're doing nothing, and five being it's really mature and you're innovative and all this other stuff. But three is typically where companies are at. Sometimes a two, depending on a bunch of different things. But it's all about creating that that awareness to say, hey, if you're not paying it, like to me, if you're not paying attention to the key performance indicators, you aren't taking a look at the fundamentals of the program you're not doing a sufficient job analyzing what's going on in your organization. But the other thing too, is that relationship um, that you have with senior management, for example. Um, I have found that a lot of companies, they don't, especially that reporting, depending on how enlightened your CIO is, they don't want to hear that you got a pro there's a big problem here. They've got their own problems. And, and to me, security has got to be part of that. So you've got to be very careful in that dance because how do you make changes in an organization? You do it with a smile. You do it, you know, trying to say, hey, things are great. And you're buddy, buddy and, you know, trying to deal with things. But a lot of times they don't want to hear that there's a massive issue that needs to be focused on, you know, for a lot of the less mature, more insecure CIOs, you know, and the th thing is, there's some justification for that. I mean, there's levels of toxicity and I can, that's a whole nother conversation when it comes to taking a look at how I assess organizations, but you know, in some cases, you've got to do that because you've got to start building the confidence in order to create the right atmosphere in order to do things. So the culture building to me is the first thing. Like I was talking to somebody who's an aspiring CISO and he's a very good tech head. I completely respect him as a tech head. Um, and he knows his cybersecurity, he knows how to install the firewalls. He knows how to do all this other stuff. And he said, well, yeah, but if you saw this, wouldn't you, wouldn't the first thing you do be this? Like, not necessarily. Um, my first thing I would do is get involved in the culture. You know, um, there's so many management models that are out there that are talking about that. And once you get in on the culture and then you start making those changes, that's where everything starts to smooth over in the long run. And that's where a CISO should be. Um, you know, it's interesting, like I have not brought one in, but talking to a lot of different CISOs, some of the more successful ones at larger organizations, what do you think their first hire was? Um, I'm going to give you a clue right now. Um, they're bringing in a PR consultant. How should we market cybersecurity within the organization? And so that goes back to the whole cultural argument about how should you approach cybersecurity in your organization? And sometimes it's a learning curve. And I think that I've seen CEOs, like I, I left a place partially due to the fact that day one, I'm just like, I would like to get aligned with you. Let's check on a few things here to see how you feel about it. And I was squatted down like I was a little gnat. And so I think there's a lot of education that business leaders need to go through um, to understand what cybersecurity is and understand just how that dynamic is taking place between the different constituents within an organization. And sometimes it's going to be the COO. There's a lot of different models you can get into in terms of that. But um, those are just a few thoughts I have. Sorry, I'm a big talker. So I keep no, going. No, I appreciate it. I It's something that I've been thinking a lot about since January 1st. I, I think we, we're not a B, we're not a business associate, we're not a healthcare, uh, but what I think the thing that I'm struggling with the most, I don't want to take up the rest of the time, but um, I'll connect with you on LinkedIn. Hopefully we can sure. talk a little bit more, but it's, I can't, I'm struggling to stress the reputational damn, like the cost of, of something, a bad breach happening. Like we're not talking about the, the, the OCR is going to come and talk to us, mm -hmm. but what are our customers going to think? And that's like, how do I quantify that? And that's something I've, I've really been trying to do my research and it, figure out. It, it so. depends. I mean, the thing is like, if you're, if there's one hospital in the amount of rural, and I have no idea where you're from, I mean, I'm assuming Florida, but maybe not. But if you're like in a rural area and there's one hospital for a hundred miles, you know what? 
you're kind of stuck. You got to deal with that one hospital, you know? Um, and so this stuff is very difficult to quite try to quantify. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it is a little bit art and anybody who tells you they're hundred percent perfect in everything they do when it comes to risk, they're lying to you. Yeah. I'm just going to be very honest with you right now. Cause there's a, there's, there's some estimation and guesswork that's going on. And that's just one factor right there for what I'm bringing up. You do the best job you can based on the available data sources. Yeah. Again, I appreciate the presentation. It was great. Thank you. Anybody else? I actually have a question for you, sir. Sure. Um, I'm the I'm the guy who currently is uh, risking compliance at a healthcare facility. One of the big issues that we're looking at right now is that we we effectively have two networks throughout the company, and the the secondary one is is you know, uh, complementary for employees. So it's it's basically not really there. Then everything else from my laptop to all of our uh, IOMT devices are on that network. And we've identified that as an issue, but we don't really know where to go from there. What kind of steps would you recommend? Like, should, uh, you know, should the network be separated? Are there any frameworks to keep in mind for that? Um, software as companies, just any kind of direction that you can think of to, to at least get us started down a, a better network infrastructure path, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, there, a lot of frameworks do have something that's in it. Um, and sometimes what I do is I kind of pick and choose different things. I'm, and I, it, I'll be honest, it, it, I've been through enough of these types of things where I just just will come up with the stuff off the top of my head. Um, obviously, I mean, like I'm, I was just telling Mike before this started, I'm working with a new framework I've never touched before. It's out of Europe, you know, and I've, but I'm learning a lot from it uh, for how they look at security. But they even have stuff like you need to need things on a separate VLAN. You need a separate VLAN ACL. Um, but this stuff takes a lot of time. But I would take a look at the most if you have the if you have the data. It's tough to know, but I would look at the most vulnerable systems that are out there first and try to try to put those on a separate network and then slowly start to build a network ACL. But the reality is this is all getting into techno babble and. You need the business case in order to make it. Like clearly, you know what to do. Um, there might be a couple steps A, B, C to kind of figure out how to do stuff, but you let the IT teams figure that stuff out from a risk standpoint. Um, but you make the business case. You know how much risk are we in as a result of the intermingling of IT and IOMT devices on the same VLAN and doing this across the board? You've got no protection. Your servers are not protected where a lot of the data is going to be. That's a big issue too. I'd want to separate the servers from the workstations and the IOMT devices. I'd want to make sure that you've got the appropriate gateways and tight ACLs going into the server network. Um, if they're connected to the internet, that's a whole nother issue because then you get into application security and how do you have, do you have a database server? And I've seen this have to be on the DMZ, the demilitarized zone. So there's an architectural component. Like I would partner, like I hope, I'm hoping you have an uh, enterprise architect there who's able to work with you and help you think about some of these things. I mean, I can do it off the top of my head and I'm giving you a few tips, but the reality is you've got to take a real deep dive on enterprise architecture. Like I'm a big fan of uh, SABSA. I know there's TOGAF and some others that are out there, but, um, you know, making sure that it's like, hey, here's the build, here's the security that's in place. And oftentimes I find pictures are great. That's one thing I love about SABSA. Uh, SABSA, for those who are not familiar with, is a Sherwood Applied Business Security Architecture. And they've got a lot of great pieces of information that are coming out of it. But what they do is they'll show the layered, the stack diagram for what's in there. Okay, we've got file integrity monitoring. Okay, we've got antivirus with EDR and MDR being tied into it. And so you create this whole model of what's the security protection stack. And sometimes that visualization is a good way to get across because different people think about things in different ways. I am reasonably good. I'm a very conceptual person, so I love playing with the concept. I usually can pick up on things pretty quickly from the way people are describing things. This doesn't mean that everybody understands things the same way I do. I've got to think, okay, well, how is it that they think? And you sit there and get to know them. And sometimes when you bring in a diagram, it just like, it lightens up. Like, oh, I didn't get that. Oh, we have three times as many IOMT devices as others and they're unprotected. Oh, you know, their, their heads are in a completely different space when you're talking about from the business standpoint. And you know that's why the business skills are so important in the chief information security officer role, because you need to get other people thinking about how uh, to communicate with the business in a manner that's going to resonate with them. The challenges are not just technical. Technical challenges, on a certain sense, and I'm not trying to be pejorative here, are relatively easy people um, are a bit of a challenge to kind of figure out how all this stuff fits together. But that's what's really needed. 
in the modern CISO today because we're about changing people's minds. We're about negotiating. Um, there's a lot of different options that are out there, but it's about also getting to know your environment, you know, uh, and in some cases you've got to get through other barriers in order to get to the barriers that you need to get to, to start having the conversation. Um, you know, other companies are more mature. Like I, I know companies that do have a strong uh, cyber risk quantification, CRQ for their organization. And all the major decisions are being brought to that particular team in order for them to do the quantification. So you can just take that off your lap. But most modern CISOs today are not in that lucky situation to have a whole team to do that analysis for you. And so you try to feed them as much data as possible and educate them. And, you know, to me, this is where there's a, a tremendous amount of value uh, just having a cybersecurity committee of some kind where you're getting people on board to understand your viewpoint. You've got to figure out who your allies are, get your allies in there. Then when you actually go in and have the conversation, it's a lot easier because if you've got four people going in and disagreeing with that one CEO or COO or whatever your context is, that whole conversation changes. You know, So it isn't just somebody just blabbing something out. It's create the process around it. Like I'm a big fan of the written word. Um, I do believe that writing is one of the most important skills when it comes to statecraft. And if you have it written down, you get somebody to take the right ownership and sign off on it. That changes the whole ball game. Um, in my sales role, uh, having been to a lot of different corporations throughout the tri-state region and beyond, I know CEOs that are like, nope, critical risk. I'm signing off on it. And the CISO is completely flustered. And you know, what do you do at that point? They had no board of directors. So it's like, ah, who cares? And it was completely flamboyant all over. He clearly did not have any allies. He didn't seek and work to figure out who the allies are. You've got to make the right connections. Make sure the legal team, if you have internal auditor team, pull them in, make them part of your team, make them understand what the issues are. So when you're going in and having the conversation, it is 10 times easier to have a conversation once you've got your allies in place. So I'm, again, I'm, I think about this stuff pretty deeply. So no, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Yep. Anybody else? I think Carson, you had a question. Yes, I did. <clears throat> um, one of the, I'm a past manufacturing engineer and I always dealt in dollars, but I've worked with a couple of medical centers where my wife works as a nurse. And what I've found, they're more concerned with disclosure. They've had people that have quite literally killed people. And they said, yeah, we'll accept your resignation today so that they don't have to write it up and have it disclosed. And what a different mindset that has been to work with. Yeah, I'm sure. And so when you're talking to the board, it's really not the way that I was taught to think in dollars and cents as much as possible disclosures. And so, you know, with breaches, that's an easy subject, but it's just a really different way of thinking when you're working with the medical folks, at least in the smaller medical centers. Yeah, I can see that. I mean, it's interesting, the different attitudes. Like I know one CEO I was bringing up that we need to start setting up disclosures and having people sign disclosure statements. He thought the idea was completely stupid. And I had the ally in place. I had the um, HIPAA lawyer coming and saying, no, this is absolutely critical. And CEO, nope, we're not doing it. Don't even bring it to my, you know, bring it to my attention. Like what, <laughs> you know? It, it is crazy some of the stuff that you see out there, and, and I believe you 100. You know, if they're they're that concerned over it, um, yeah, it's it's a it's a huge issue because then it's going to be reportable. They can end up on the HIPAA wall of shame. Nobody wants to be on that HIPAA wall of shame. I mean, that's kind of the cudgel you have in, in one of the cudgels you have in the healthcare space that's not actually out there in some of the other spaces. Um, I do think it's a great tool, but it's not 100 for sure. And because you're ultimately you're dealing with people and people are so different from one another. And one person may have one opinion, another person may have another. So you've got to kind of look at things and take it one day at a time and see what works. Thank you. Anybody else? Hey, Matthew, we have uh, I think we have a couple of questions here sure. uh, in chat. Um, it's like Braylon, if I'm pronouncing that right, I was wondering if you have any suggestions when trying to gain an internship and a follow on of what certifications should they pursue? So when I approach certifications, I mean, they show a certain amount of knowledge at a certain point in time. Um, I have a lot myself, but the reality is what interests you? Because to me, everything is interconnected. Ultimately, at some point, either you go into that side or you decide you're into it. I know people who've gotten a cybersecurity who've left. You know, it's a very uh, uh, common thing to deal with. But what are you interested in doing? You know, if identity, there's there there's sites out there. I have to go dig them up, but they'll have like 
a list of like a hundred plus different certifications you can get. Um, you know, if you're just getting started, you know, sometimes some basic stuff to get some general overview of the, the uh, security plus certification is not a bad place to go because it gives you like just a real high level set of concepts uh, to work with, you know, but if you're really interested in the network security, there are people who do nothing but focus on network security their entire lives. That's a great place to get started. But one of the things that I have uh, eventually kind of come to a realization from, you kind of drink Kool-Aid a little bit when you're getting the certification. I, like I've got the Cisco certifications and they're great. I learned a lot about networking just from Cisco before. And I was applying it a little bit in my work environments. Um, but the reality is there is so much innovation going on in the cybersecurity space. That's one of the reasons I love it because there's just so much happening. It's, it's, it's a very exciting field to jump into. But you learn just as much going to vendors, uh, conferences, and talking to them and seeing their viewpoint and hearing all these different things, because it's not just about one Kool-Aid, it's like a thousand different Kool-Aids and, and, and mixing it all together to see what's going to be working right for an organization. Um, you know, I, I, it's hard for me to kind of direct you because I believe that it's important to, to figure out what's going to be the right direction for you to go. You know, if you want to do vulnerability management, and it's a lot more complicated than a lot of people think that it is, especially in larger organizations, that could be a very fascinating field. And you could decide, oh, this is great. You know, like, for example, when I've run threat and vulnerability programs, I've tied configurations into it as well. So you add the configuration side of it, and that's a whole field that you can get into. Um, there, you, I've had to do a lot with that over the years. But the other thing is you might decide, you know what, I really like pen testing. So maybe you want to go get Crest or some of these other certifications. Um, some interesting places to go are SANS. I mean, there's a lot of options there and you can get a master's degree through them as well. If that's a direction you want to go, they're definitely pricey. But, you know, if you if you if budget is a concern, there's a lot of great places you can go. Like Cyberary has a lot of great places you can uh, pull some information up. Take a look at YouTube videos, understand where others are coming from. So um, it's hard for me to, to give you a direct, but those are a few ideas I have just off the... Uh, top of my head. And what about um, trying to gain an internship tips oh, an you internship. have for somebody entering the market? Um, uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's definitely organizations that uh, do that. Um, I have not actually gone down the internship. I've personally never hired an intern myself. Um, one of the challenges that often face, and Jonathan, I think you probably have faced this yourself um, uh, in that role, is cybersecurity is usually squeezed. We don't have enough money to get a lot of things done. And when you talk about the input, when you bring in somebody brand new into an organization, internships are sometimes a little bit more difficult because unless you've got a lot of support and your, your business team is going to say, yep, we're, we're going to take this and we're going to give you the runway to make mistakes and allow them to make mistakes to kind of grow. And I've seen it be very successful in some organizations. Typically in organizations, though, it's like if you bring in a level one person in the middle of that, in the middle of the environment, it's very tough. And so once you get involved, like I would look for maybe a managed security services provider, because what's good about that, let's say if they're, if they have a security operation center, they've got their level one analyst, the level two analyst, level three analyst, they've got all this stuff decided. How are you going to go? You learn how to do that. But the reality is what happens is in, in bigger organizations, they're going to train you. They're going to go from one place to another, and then you can start building up from there, but it's going to take a little bit longer to get up to like level three. Um, but sometimes people get bored of it and realize I have no desire to do this because a lot of them, what they're going to do is they're going to work you on 12 hour shifts, three hours, one week, or sorry, three days, one week, four days, the next week on this, on these 12 hour shifts. Um, so it, it's all about what is going to be right for you and what, what you're really interested in doing. There's, there's probably a lot of opportunities, but I just haven't had the time to, uh, look into doing internships myself, but hopefully these tips are helpful. You're welcome. I kind of see it now. Anybody else? Be shy. <laughs> I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> so, yeah, I, um, hi, my name is Victor. Um, I was, I wanted to just, um, comment something that from one of your slides, if you can come back, uh, those um with uh i think it was a graph with the amount of like products that have more cyber incidents or vulnerabilities do, do you mind going back to, to that one i would like to pointerize something there because i've been um um in my early career i started working at your and the writer laboratories so we i did uh certification on product security and one of the things that um we we realized when when i was testing those um, and most of them were um, uh, imagining um, imagining uh, devices, 
right? Like um, Rx, um, like um, uh, among others, right? Where they, the, the reason why you had like that 60 something percent on that graph is because there's like a legacy protocol called Dicom that is a digital imaging communications, right? And that's like a protocol that is like very old. So all the data between that medical device and like the endpoint of the server side, it's basically everything in clear text, right? PHI, PII, like the actually the image system. Um, that's why we see that higher numbers there. But the point here is um, one of when when I was working there and it was very hard for me to uh, try to understand is like the industry doesn't or the time when I when the time I was there working at uh, security is like the industry is not there. They're not making changes on secure protocols. Uh, the vendors actually rely on the network security of like the organizations in order to secure the data, right? So that is where like come from like um, ideas like, oh, I'm going to create VPNs between like a, um, like an um, Rx device and like uh, the DICOM like endpoint, right? And that was basically creating is more and more advanced or more complicated environment instead of like going through the root cause of the problem that is we are using very old protocols that are actually not uh secure at all at this time of the of uh, on, on this time right um just punctualizing a little bit that um and under, to let them people that were in the conversation today why we have those higher numbers um because like uh, versus what we had in like the infusion pumps, that is another product that you put there that are basically uh, they they work more or less with HTTPS protocols to talk between like the infusion pumps and and the server side too, just um, to punctualize another thing. And another thing that I would like to bring to is like you brought like the UL 2900 um, as one of the first certifiers of UL 2900. One of the things uh, this is only for product security, but um, it's a good certification, but it's a very hard certification to pass because they, again, the vendors are not there yet. They're okay. still relying in 10 years ago when the design and they're designing a product that takes 10 years to, to accomplish. So it's actually one of the things that I experienced working there was like the industry is not yet. Right. Um, and that, and this was like four years ago when I, when I left as well. Right. So just like two points that um, um, I wanted to to add the conversation that I think is in, in interesting to, to have. Yeah, and, and I think that's that's very helpful. So a lot of this stuff, great, we've solved it on paper. You know, like the UL twenty nine hundred. There's a lot of times there there aren't enough vendors out there that are going to be UL twenty nine hundred compliant to get done what needs to be done. Sometimes you've got to make decisions that are more business oriented, and they take security backwards several steps. But I think that, you know, some of the other stuff that we're seeing, it's going to start to move things in the right direction, as I said before, like the new IoT grading system. You know, I think that's going to be a step in the right direction because I agree with you. There's stuff that's just putting out there. Like I mentioned with the vulnerabilities from 1999, that is horrendous to see something like that today. Um, and, and I agree with you. That's that's definitely a, a big issue. Um, I'm trying to, there's one, oh yeah. So you, you, I hear you on the point about the network is going to be protected, but there's a there's an age-old expression as you were talking that kind of came to my head, and I wish I invented it, but it was invented be long before I jumped into cybersecurity. But it's the old model of, and I and it's meant to be in a pejorative sense, crunchy on the outside, chewy on the inside. You know, and, and the reality is, um, you know, the the conversation in security has changed greatly over the years. You know, it used to be like, well, if you're compromised, then it's like, well, you already are, or you like, it's going to be when, and then it became to you already are, and you don't know it. And that's, I think, getting a little bit closer to the reality of what corporations are facing today. Um, but a lot of times they just don't have the, the data or the systems to be able to detect it or be aware of it. Um, I think some of the modern technologies that are coming out, like out of EDR and MDR, they're getting a lot better at detecting it because they're using machine learning and some of these advanced techniques because traditional antivirus, as Semantic pointed out, I think it was in 2014, said antivirus is 
dead, you know, because it was catching 45% of the problems. But uh, I think it was a 2015 Verizon Data Breach Investigation Report. It was something like 80% of breaches were due to malware that was customized on that per institution basis. And that that's now ages ago. You're closing in on 10 years ago when that was true. But I still it still rings true today because so much malware is being created. And they actually have uh, polymorphic and metamorphic. I think I, I didn't go into the details of what the their definitions were, but um, basically the malware could change and jump from one type of system, say from an Apple to a PC pretty easily. And so then it would adapt itself and change it, but then it was metamorphic. So if it went from one system to another, it would have a completely different signature associated with it because it would be changing. So we can't afford to have um, a, an organization because there's so many issues with, with so because like part of the analysis that I do when I'm looking at a company is kind of a vector analysis. You know, how strong is your secure web gateway? How strong is your secure email gateway? How is your firewall set up? Have you done the appropriate access control list reviews? Are you hardening the systems? All of these different types of things. And there's a lot more you can add into this, this whole process, but it's about... Um, creating the right level of understanding of the controls that you have and say, how secure are you? Um, a lot of the secure web gateways that are out there aren't protecting against uh, malware. All they do is say, oh, okay, we're, we're going to get rid of a few bad sites we don't want you to look at. Some of them are like most of the sites that are created within two days usually have malware on it. And that's yet another aspect of looking at secure web gateways. Um, but a lot of the systems that are out there don't even include that type of capability. So you also need a DNS capability to be able to monitor and block against those types of attacks in addition to whatever else you have. And then the other challenges of, you know, moving off of your network onto local workstations or laptops that are, you know, being used by the sales team all over the place. So segmentation within a network is, is incredibly important. Um, but, and I do think the old uh, crunchy on the outside, chewy on the inside model is just insufficient to protect us against today's threats, especially in a hospital environment where a good chunk of the system you literally can't protect against. That's that's the view that I would take. But your point is well taken. Anybody else? No, this was a very good presentation. Thank you. Yeah, if there's nobody else, then uh, feel free to, I think, connect with Matthew on LinkedIn if you don't oh, mind. Perfect. Go ahead. Sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't realize I was uh, not on mute. Uh, did you have a question? No, but it was a really good presentation. Oh, Thank okay. you. I just yeah. put my uh, LinkedIn profile in the chat. Yeah. So thanks so much for tonight's presentation and, and taking time to answer everybody's questions. Uh, definitely been insightful, uh, Matthew, and uh, we appreciate your time uh, sure. staying for so long with us too. Um, as we mentioned earlier, this has been recorded. And once we edit it, we'll be uploading it to YouTube. The The link to our YouTube channel was uh, dumped in the chat at a certain point. Uh, but if you search on YouTube for uh, SWFL or Swiffle uh, SEC, so SWFL SEC, uh, you'll come to our channel. You'll find a lot of our older uh, meetup presentations as well there. And as we have more and get them edited, they'll continue to be uploaded there. So thank you so much, for everybody, for attending tonight. Uh, Yeah.